being recorded as well. Uh, if you need uh, assistance, please send a message to, uh, with any uh, technical issues here, to with, uh, send a message to Dominique Lewenberger uh, through the chat function. Thanks, Colin. Uh, well, thank you, Patrick. Uh, before going uh, into the first panel, perhaps we can first invite uh, Care Mutes, who collect the work stream or the report, to provide us, us with some uh, introductory remarks. Care? Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, I have great pleasure in introducing this report. We started the work in January 2020, initially forming a work stream on the Financial Information Network. We draw on discussions with firms, academics, Available. The work stream conducted a survey of its members, international organisations and other standard setting bodies in early 2020 and that enabled us to better understand the use of subtech tools and how they monitored regtech adoption by market participants. In the survey evidence, most authorities confirmed they had a subtech strategy in place or in process of developing one. A third of respondents had a regtech strategy in place and the majority indicated that regulated entities in their jurisdiction were using regtech tools. From a data analytics perspective, most authorities are still at the beginning of their subtech journeys and approximately 50% of all data analytical outputs used by authorities are descriptive and backward looking in nature, while only 11% are predictive. Additionally, authorities have expressed that approximately 70% of the tools they use to distribute and present these outputs are legacy systems or statistical reports. The work streams, as you can imagine, identified not only benefits but challenges and risks to doing to the work. Although Subtech may allow for integration of additional structured and analysis, making analysis richer, while also identifying patterns in the data that may not be apparent to human review. Ongoing digitalization of data may improve the efficiency and effectiveness of operational procedures, while the automation of processes may reduce IT and staffing costs. There were a number of challenges identified. One of the biggest authorities face, based on our FSB survey, is a lack of resources. More than 50% express it as their highest risk. So to stay abreast of technologies, developments, and be successful in the implementation, may need to pursue a range of staff related actions and these resource requirements and costs are predicted to increase as regulatory authorities seek to bring in specialists such as data scientists and engineers while also introducing training programs to upskill their staff and on the risks regulatory authorities face increased legal and reputational challenges arising from any decisions based solely on ai derived analysis without appropriate human oversight so the lack of transparency and explainability of decisions without um, coming out of sort of black box, subtech, regtech, AI models, data bias and poor quality data may result in spurious rather than meaningful signals or alerts. In turn, regulated institutions might raise legitimate questions about the fair and transparent use of certain data for regulatory decision making. From a financial st stability perspective, RegTech and Subtech promise to add new means to improve macro and micro supervision, oversight and enforcement by authorities, and reporting and compliance by financial institutions, thereby potentially strengthening the resilience of the financial system. The report offers a number of recommendations in the approach authorities might wish to take to further develop their data strategies, senior management buy-in and engagement, talent strategies, and the development of new tools and techniques. Standard setters and authorities may wish to consider evaluating the scope for common data standards and taxonomies for relevant regulatory areas, including the potential for much more international collaboration. So there's no one size fits all as to whether to build subtech tools in house or invest in third party solutions. So authorities may wish to weigh up the operational trade-offs involved in the two approaches and find the right mix. I hope you all found the report as an interesting read for the work stream. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kaya. Uh, I, I think the, the report is very comprehensive and very well written. And thank you for, for setting the scene for, for today's you know, panel. 
Uh, next, perhaps we can, you know, go right straight right into the first panel, and it is about how data will enable the use of sub 10 red 10. Uh, the first panel will be moderated by Tom, and so perhaps I can pass it over to Tom right now. Thank you, Colin, and thank you, uh, Claire. Um, so an outstanding and, uh, and very international uh, panel uh, from uh, right across the globe. Um, so to it, uh, and this is the view from the uh, from the public sector, uh, from the officials about how they're using uh, regtech, subtech, uh, and big data in uh, in their supervision. Um, I will uh, uh, give a, a minute or two to each of the, the panelists uh, to introduce themselves, and, and we'll all start with the same uh, opening question, um, which is uh, how is technology and data uh, influencing uh, and affecting your supervisory and regulatory processes in your authority? Uh, to start, uh, we'll go to uh, to, to Chang People's Bank of China. Uh, Chang Chung, over to you. Uh, this this is uh, Chang Chun from the People's Bank of China. I'm the uh, head of the Digital Currency Institute, and uh, <clears throat> we actually we designed uh, a offsite supervision information system for payment trans transactions based on uh, API technology and. Uh, our system introduced the technology such as uh, AI, big data, cloud computing, data mining into the payment industry supervision. And uh, our system is developed uh, based on API technology with AI analysis of big data. And the system adopts a module and layered approach, uh, which integrates functions of data na analysis uh, business uh, supervision and uh, statistical decision making and risk control. The system collects the payment transactions data and the regulatory information via, via standardized API. And our system, uh, since our system adopts a uh, layered infrastructure as a service, uh, that is the ICE uh, solution. And it adopts a improved unified unifield architecture and applied technologies such as knowledge graph and the artificial uh, neural network, and uh, in, it also incorporates artificial intelligence and analysis and the modeling process into the data flow process. We also apply technologies such as supervision agent and enables visualization such as dynamic risk dashboards and graphs. It also could, could track behavior like uh, payment transactions and reduce the density and the complexity of raw data by trans transforming it into a uh, uh, para, uh, uh, panoramic uh, uh, dashboard and data map. So that's the brief uh, introduction of our, our API uh, system of uh, the uh, payment supervision. Thank you. Thank you so much. A huge amount there in a very short uh, in a very short period of time. Uh, I suspect that uh, APIs is something we'll talk about a lot today, uh, as is the, uh, the the idea of offsite uh, supervision. Um, so next uh, to Canada uh, to uh, Alejandro. Uh, Alejandro, uh, perhaps you'd just like to explain how you're using technology and data in the supervisory yeah. process. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so thanks for the invitation. I think um, the usual disclaimer applies. Uh, my views do not represent those of the Bank of Canada, but having said that, let me see if I can share some light on, on some of the work that we do uh, that may be relevant. Um, as you um, as you pointed out, I think um, there are new technologies that are giving us access to, to, to better and richer data. So I'll emphasize some points on the data and then some points on the technology. So the first one is, I think, having access to richer data. And by this, I mean um, the use of micro data where available. That is something, when we talk about micro data, I think this unit level data that can provide information about the characteristics of individuals, entities, groups, or geography, that's a much richer data set that allows to do more in-depth understanding of economic and risk management questions. And given that it's a much richer uh, data set, it, it begs for a new technology to analyze it in an efficient way. So the access of that micro data is sparking, I think, more the need for technologies to to analyze and learn from those um, those data sets. And, and, and that data, I think, can be useful for what if um, experiments, a stress test, and, and so on. Second point is also with data is um, 
the idea of alternative data sets. And by this, I mean, um, what can we learn from uh, social media data, Twitter feeds that may provide some signals for economic activity, right? And, and this is something that, um, that I think is, is, is interesting to explore. <clears throat> and excuse me, the last point I think is more in terms of the, maybe once you have this data sets is what are the technologies that you can use to automate uh, this, we could call it exploratory data analysis, right? And I think the entry barrier um, is, uh, is, much, uh, is much lower now because there's a whole set of different packages and libraries that one can get from uh, R and Python that can be used to do um, AI and different sort of uh, techniques to analyze the data. So I know we're short on time, so why don't I stop there and, and, and turn it to, back to you. Hello. Um, really interesting stuff. Um, uh, Microdata, uh, a really interesting uh, concept. And uh, the question of social media and what that can tell us, um, again, uh, really, um, really fascinating. Um, and certainly something that uh, Claire and colleagues in the Bank of England have been thinking about uh, as well. Uh, so perhaps now turning uh, to, uh, to to Kenneth uh, in Singapore. Um, Kenneth, perhaps you'd just like to, to, to explain to us how you're using uh, RegTech and data in your supervision, uh, recognised as a as a prominent leader in this, I think, in Singapore. Hi, so uh, good morning and afternoon and evening to everyone. It's a pleasure uh, to meet all of you virtually. So a quick introduction uh, to myself. My name is uh, Kenneth Gay from the Monetary Authority of Singapore. I head up a uh, fairly new the established unit at the authority that looks at uh, what we call enterprise uh, knowledge. So this is actually uh, a combination of both um, structured as well as unstructured data. Uh, so in, in our remit, we, our, our goal is actually to um, aid all departments, uh, all functions of our uh, central bank as well as our financial regulator uh, to achieve uh, its objectives. And of course, in the context of uh, supervisory technology and rec tech, uh, is really trying to empower these goals as well. <clears throat> so just briefly, I think um, the, the the recent COVID crisis has been quite a challenge, of course, for, for all of us. And this proved a good opportunity uh, for MES to actually deploy um, various, I would say, um, solutions using both um, structured as well as unstructured data uh, in order to meet our objectives. So I'll just touch on a few quickly in the interest of time. Uh, I think on in, in the area of structured data, for instance, uh, I was, we were able to help our supervisory uh, departments uh, to actually uh, better monitor, uh, you know, uh, on a more real-time basis, uh, some of the issues that uh, relate to uh, proper, uh, in a way, uh, how, how to facilitate proper uh, safe bank operations whilst maintaining, uh, you know, uh, rules such as uh, proper social distancing, for instance. So we were able to track it on like a, a hourly basis and be able to report back that information and this would actually enable, uh, you know, uh, the, the smoother so-called and safe operation of bank branches. And on the unstructured data side, uh, we are also able to uh, utilize, of course, uh, the, the common uh, techniques such as natural language processing in order to be able to uh, better understand on a more real-time basis uh, concerns that uh, both uh, consumers and businesses were raising uh, as a result of the COVID crisis and uh, better able to uh, calibrate our responses as well on a real-time basis. Yeah, so I'll hand it over to the, the next one. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kenneth. Um, always good to hear uh, the, uh, the action of turning a, a crisis into an opportunity. Uh, it's, always, uh, it's always good to hear. Um, so next, we're going to go to, um, to, to Catherine. So uh, Catherine in, in Hong Kong, perhaps you'd just like to uh, explain to us uh, how in the HKMA you're using uh, data and technology and supervision. Sure, thank you. Um, so very nice to meet you all. I'm Catherine from the HKMA. I work within the super, uh, banking supervision department within HKMA, specifically within the supervisory technology division. So um, we're, we're kind of a new unit that was set up at the beginning of the year, having mandates of you know overlooking the supervisory technology adoption within the HKMA, and also regulatory technology adoption by the banking sector. So um, specifically in the realms of SubTech, um, we're kind of uh, very um, early on in our journey in terms of um, adopting new technologies, but we do have a vision of how that may look up, turn, turn out to be in the next few years. So um, basically we have um, engaged a consultant to grow up a 
three year roadmap in terms of um, adopting technologies such as you know project process automation in enabling us to collect um, our structured data from the public domain more uh, efficiently combining with the internal data that we have be it structured or unstructured and how to pull uh, additional insights from the um, new collection of data information that we have um, also, we are also um, looking into other um, emerging technologies such as natural language processing technologies that could be categorized to assign sentiment scores to large quantities of news related to the supervised institutions. Um, as an example, it could be easier for supervisors to review the information involved, having this technology to keep track of the different types of risks facing supervised institutions. Another way um, that we would be potentially exploring is how to better visualize this um, huge amount of um, new information that we have, such as you know, the building of, of network analysis to understand data uh, more easily. So um, as another example, we try to explore how data about corporate shareholding or large exposures, which potentially could be brought to life as network diagrams, such that the relationships between the different entities become more apparent. And this can enable us to detect early warning signs regarding systematic um, risks associated with the entire credit network. But I think ultimately, SubTech is about leveraging computing power technology to unlock more meaningful insights from the growing volumes and types of data that are available to the banking supervisors. And this is very much um, at the core of the SubTech vision that we have as we embark on this digitalization journey. Um, so, yeah. In the interest of time, I hand over back to Tom. Um, so, uh, finally, just to set up um, uh, their uh, approach to uh, subtech uh, and uh, technology and data in supervision. Now we're going to go to, uh, to Francesca in Italy. Um, I first came across Francesca actually as an academic at, uh, at University College London, um, uh, but now with a consult in Italy. Uh, so, Francesca, over to you. Hello, thank you. Thank you very much. So, as you, as Tom say, I'm, um, I'm in the uh, agency that is the supervisory and regulatory agency for the Italian financial market. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, because we are in Italy, we are under the jurisdiction of uh, Europe. So, under the regulation that we have in Europe. And it's interesting that I wanted to say that because uh, the four uh, fundamental regulation that we have in Europe, so the financial regulation, the data protection, uh, open banking, and digital identity, which uh, regulate all our uh, action, and in some way, strangely, because I don't think this was in the regulator idea, but strangely has pushed all of us to move towards rec tech and sub tech. Uh, for example, uh, financial regulation requires us uh, to have access uh, to data. So I have moved uh, move all of our agency like Consob towards uh, datification, digitalization. But then there are also regulations like uh, the data protection that create barriers. So they push us to look to more sophisticated uh, system. So this is uh, the overall. If I go back to our agency, um, two uh, things that we have done. So, first of all, we have set up the strategy, the digitalization strategy, as well the data strategies. And based on that, we can really coordinate a plan. Um, our work now is on supervision, for example. And um, we are, for example, we have already developed a very advanced, a kind of advanced uh, algorithm to identify the uh, severity in our supervision for the what we call uh, store report, so suspicion transaction and order report. And so we have an algorithm that tell us, for example, the severity because we receive over 400 spot, uh, store report. And now we are working in order to develop much more advanced. So we have uh, several uh, projects and uh, that is what we are doing here in Italy. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, nice to see you again. Um, so I think we'll, uh, we'll discuss the next topic, uh, which is that um, there are uh, a lot of, uh, of attendees here um, from, uh, from regulatory authorities who are not members of the FSB. Um, and I think they'd be really interested in hearing uh, from those who've been involved in thinking about, uh, uh, about RegTech and SubTech, about where the biggest opportunities uh, are. 
So uh, perhaps I'll, I'll start with, with you, Kenneth, if that's okay. Um, if you were to, to pick uh, one application of, uh, of Suttech uh, that you think has the biggest opportunities for the future, uh, what would that be? Oh, thanks very much, Tom, for that question. Uh, perhaps if I could uh, uh, re reframe the, my, my answer slightly, perhaps, I think, uh, and, and, and starting really with, with the, the premise that you have set out, you know, trying to reach out to uh, the many participants here who are from, you know, regulatory and supervisory authorities around the world. I think the first and most important message that I would like to perhaps share with everyone on this RegTech and SuperTech journey is we, we should start with the basics. And the basics really revolve around improving and facilitating access to the relevant information and data that we need in order to achieve our SuperTech and RegTech goals. So even getting these basics correct, I think can really make a very big difference. So. Uh, perhaps let me start perhaps with data collection, for instance. If we can think of ways that we can actually improve and, and make more efficient uh, our data collection, uh, being able to collect more relevant, more timely, and more granular data uh, from our regulated institutions, that already helps a lot uh, in terms of improving the outcomes. Uh, second, if we are also able to then combine this information uh, with other types of information that we, we, we find useful in order to achieve our regulatory and supervisory objectives, for example, unstructured data such as news or other reports that actually we, uh, you know, uh, 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 come across, uh, that will also be very helpful as well. So once we have this data together, I would say, um, you know, that, then we can start thinking about really, you know, what what are the uh, uh, use cases that we can have for it, and each um, supervisory or regulatory uh, issue that we look at would necessitate uh, a different kind of uh, use case. So. For instance, if I'm an interested uh, in analyzing, uh, you know, potential risks um, arising, for example, from, I don't know, just pick an asset class, like say real estate, for instance, you know, because many of us right now are monitoring that market quite closely, uh, arising from, uh, of course, uh, macroeconomic trends in the market as well, as for many of us offering a uh, low moratoria as well on, on, this, on this particular asset class. So if we can find a way actually to think about how you know, uh, we can actually combine the data that we receive from our institutions with external data sources that would also be able to uh, uh, provide us with a good uh, so-called supervisory and uh, regulatory uh, outcomes as well. And the final point I would make really is that, uh, you know, uh, as we can see, you know, uh, with, with the success of many technology firms around the world, uh, what I would emphasize is also to the ability to deliver um, felt real value you know, to our supervisors and inspectors by reducing the amount of time that they spend day to day spend, uh, combining, you know, uh, uh, combining information, uh, doing manual processes so that really they can spend more time on, you know, the more deep interactions with their financial institutions and, and, and focusing on the risk that matter. So I guess, and, and to wrap up, I guess we are all on this journey together and uh, we should uh, continue this uh, collaboration process like this event and, uh, you know, share our uh, findings and best practices as well. Thank you. Fantastic. Couldn't agree more, Kenneth. Um, and I think you know the point you make about about adding value uh, and creating as much space as possible for deeper interactions and more judgment from our supervisors uh, is is really when it comes to subtech. Uh, also delighted to see that uh, Ricky uh, has um, has uh, started the process of of questions. Um, what we'll do, uh, Ricky and uh, panelists, is we'll keep all the questions. Uh, for the end, um, in the final session of the day uh, Q and A, uh, where we'll ask both uh, the official sector panelists and the private sector attendees uh, to answer these questions. Uh, so Patrick and the Secretariat will be uh, will be saving up the questions, uh, and we'll we'll come to them at the end. Um, so don't worry, Ricky, we will get to it. Uh, it looks like an excellent question. Uh, so next, perhaps I'll go to uh, to Catherine in Hong Kong. Um, just uh, Catherine, you just take us through uh, where you see the biggest opportunities uh, relating to subtech. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you've you've got your three year roadmap. What, what what's the particular, the most promising opportunity? Sure. Um, so I think there are plenty of opportunities that um, it's difficult to highlight in just um, a few minutes here. But um, given the theme of data tonight, I think um, I could mention something about the um, opportunities around big data to become um, to, you know help us to become more proactive and agile as banking supervisors. I already touched on earlier that um, SIPTEC could potentially help us to be more efficient and effective in the use of different types of data during the supervisory process. Um, so to elaborate that as, with an example, 
Um, so currently the mode of supervision is um, unfortunately a bit reactive. So for instance, um, say news about a corporate default starts brewing in, in the news, um, then do supervisors actually start scrambling to dig into the details and try to assess the impact that such a default will have on the wider financial system. And that actually delays the ability to take timely supervisory action. And SIPTEC could potentially um, be game changing in this. So, but by applying the advanced analytics techniques, including things like you know, automated intelligence gathering, machine learning technologies, we hope to be able to collect and cleanse data quickly and in an automated way so that high volumes of both structured and unstructured data can quickly be analyzed for supervisory consideration. Um, so, in the sample that I gave, um, it could you know, potentially include a combination of both internal, so for example, the banking returns that we collect from um, supplies institutions, and as well as external data, for example, market indicators such as you know, credit report swap spread, structured information, financial data, or you know, unstructured, for example, social media posts about a particular company, um, you know, etc. So all these amount of data could help to contribute to a more holistic understanding of the company in question and could be leveraged to generate early warning signals for supervisors. And such buffer would actually allow us to consider in advance whether supervisory action or indeed regulatory measures may be required given the nature of the issue. So at, as we mentioned, we're um, in the fairly early stages of exploring subject production, but um, it's something, um, something of this nature is definitely um, you know, high in our SIPTEC vision, and it's definitely the target state that we are going to be aiming on in that direction to help, you know, make the supervisory process more efficient and effective. Thank you, Catherine. Um, a hugely helpful insight, and uh, we're all at the start of a process here, um, and I think your expertise is going to be hugely helpful to people on this, uh, uh, on this uh, event. Um, so, uh, Francesca, uh, perhaps you could just give us your sense of where the biggest opportunities are and uh, through your work, whether you've got any advice uh, for people who might be starting on uh, their subtech journey. So I think uh, I think it's Kenneth that used the, the, the situation of the pandemic as a good opportunity. I will uh, not, I will use the same uh, same idea, but in a little different uh, different perspective, at least uh, from uh, our perspective as a supervisor, as, as uh, in our job. So we have noticed that during COVID and during the lockdown, um, cyber cyber crime and uh, particularly market manipulation has increased, uh, and therefore our uh, work has increased as well. And um, now, when we talk about the market manipula manipulation, you think of sometimes one of our problem is, for example, uh, inside trading. But inside trading, if I use an analogy that one of my colleagues use very well, it's like a passing for a in a red light uh, across and across uh, two streets. So we know it's very bad, very severe, but we know how to uh, regulate this this situation. Market manipulation, on the other hand, is really changing the, the, the traffic light and it's completely different story and it's continuously changing and we have to be very agile, flexible and uh, really move very fast. And for this reason, I think that this is an opportunity really to move on on uh, subtech and rec tech in order to create an agile and very sophisticated system to uh, verify and uh, check uh, market manipulation. So this is also where we, we are working and we are working on uh, by using complex uh, complex nectar analysis. And uh, this is a, um, so it's, it's a little bit different for our, from the application artificial intelligence, but uh, it's still uh, something that in some way related to COVID <laughs> because they study pandemic. So we have used something that is used for pandemic, for a diffusion, to study on the other hand the behavior of uh, of the of the agents inside the market so i think that there is market manipulation is an interesting interesting field where we can work a lot thank you francesca and uh, maybe just to put you on the spot um if you were to give somebody a piece of advice uh, about how to start thinking about subtech uh, what what would your what would your top piece of advice be 
<laughs> difficult you know, uh, uh, how to start but i think i think uh, the other point is to start from the from the need of the opera of what we what we what we want so no start of a very very difficult problem but start from a basic one a really very basic and that is the most interesting point when you make a difference in the activity of uh, of an agency like for example console and a small step make a, a very big difference in our work so use of the data use of the also really tagging documents, a report, still, we still do a lot of manual work still. And so SubTech can help us in the using the data much in a more efficient, effective way. Thank you, Francesca. I think uh, an excellent point about, about small steps and uh, I think it, uh, it echoes very much what Kenneth said about getting the basics right, um, which is, uh, is clearly absolutely essential. Uh, so, um, in her introduction, Claire uh, uh, outlined a number of, of challenges and obstacles that uh, as authorities we need to deal with uh, in order to get the best out of uh, SUPTEC. Um, so perhaps now we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what some of those challenges are and, and how we might respond to them. Uh, so I wonder if uh, perhaps uh, Alejandro, we could start with you and, and you could just give us your view on uh, what some of the biggest challenges are uh, and how we might respond to them. Uh, thank you, Tom. Yes, so um, so I think this is a really interesting question, um, and maybe I'll, I'll raise three points. The first point I think it's um, is uh, what I'm calling more clarity. So I think it's very easy to get uh, seduced by data, software, artificial intelligence, and I think uh, in terms of the foundations, right, it's good to have clear what is the question you're trying to answer, right? I think if you have a clear question, a clear sort of need, and this is sort of similar to, I think Francesca perhaps was saying. Uh, see what's needed, and I think after that you can start building the the relevant data and so, so have a, a clarity and a path of what you're trying to solve. That's one point. Um, the second thing is the lack of harmonization of data sets, perhaps due to legacy systems, right? So you may have data that may inform that question, but it's just not talking well to each other, just making connecting different databases and making sure that you can have the data ready to be analyzed. It's a second uh, sort of uh, obstacle. And perhaps the third one, which um, I think in no means is the, the, the least important, is, is maybe human capital, human resources, because you do you need a combination of um, ideally individuals that have a good understanding of the business, both the finance, economics, uh, supervision, banking, but also enough understanding of, um, of data science, right, and computer science, so that you end up having someone that can have a broader perspective and not having people that may understand the techniques really well, but not the business, or understand the business really well, but don't understand the techniques. So those are the three, perhaps, obstacles, the making sure that you have a path forward, um, making sure that your data is harmonized, and the third one is making sure you hire the right people. Fantastic. Uh, great advice, uh, Alejandro. And uh, yeah, I mean, those are definitely the building blocks for success, I think. Um, skills and talent, um, clearly uh, a major issue and as you said we've, we've got to get that perfect marriage of people who understand uh, the business of regulation uh, but also understand the technology and uh, that's a difficult combination to strike uh, so perhaps uh, to go to, to china to go to, to chang chung um uh chang chung you outlined quite a sophisticated approach to, to the use of sub tech um, perhaps you could just give us your view on what some of the challenges and obstacles have been and how you've dealt with them in china yeah, so uh, since we, uh, thank you, Tom, and uh, we actually build an uh, uh, enormous uh, uh, system, actually covered a lot of data. I have saw, I have seen some questions about uh, the data processing platform like us. We actually, uh, we use in-house in uh, model, in-house uh, human resources to, to, to develop a uh, in-house system to uh, do this API uh, system to collect to collecting data from all the commercial banks and payment service providers. So the biggest challenge is that we actually have already uh, encountered, uh, including uh, actually are uh, including uh, data security risk uh, because we actually this is just our system need to. Uh, needs to migrate data from payment 
uh, from decentralized storage to the centralized information platform, actually that will turn centralized uh, and uh, uh, in turn centralized and increase data security risks. The cloud computing model may also cause uh, system risks through uh, network contagion, where the uh, supervisor and supervised uh, institution system are actually interconnected through API. So, <clears throat> of course, during this process, the data security also including include uh, cyber attacks, uh, which is a key threat in the automated environment. And of course, uh, the, where the threats include data losses and uh, interruption of supervisors, supervisory attack activities. So we need a, a robust data security management framework, framework and therefore uh, to accompany the use of the system. And the second uh, challenge uh, will be the uh, operational risk. Mm -hmm. we, of course, uh, the application of automated monitoring, remote operation, AI analysis requires new supervision operating operation process and uh, reallocation of regulated resources. So uh, actually raise uh, the, the, the bar higher for the users on technical knowledge and operation. And this, Third uh, risk, which is a, a very uh, serious risk, is the privacy privacy risk, and uh, because all the uh, payment information we collected actually cover covers key personal information such as personal identity, business registration, account information, and the system actually centralizes all regulatory information in the payment industry. So the information leakage will result in serious privacy risks. So there, therefore, it's necessary to improve the security mechanism of the system and strengthen the information protection and mitigate the private risk. And the last but not, not least is the model and algorithm risk. Because we, <clears throat> the system, our system is, is heavily relying on the AI algorithm, flaws in the algorithms will definitely lead to unreliable results. Uh, that That is, uh, people already, uh, our panelists already talk about that, garbage in, garbage out. And uh, the system as a result could not eff effectively support regulatory decision-making and could have even worse consequences. So uh, in that sense, the effective monitoring mechanism and the mutual review, uh, manual review, are required to avoid regulatory uh, mis misjudgment. Thank you, Tom. Back to you. Thank you, Chang Chang. That's uh, that's uh, very very helpful. Um, thank you to to all of our panelists. Um, uh, very very helpful advice. Uh, it's uh, a journey that all of us are going on thinking about reg tech and sub tech at the moment. Uh, we're, we're all probably near the start of that journey rather than near the end um, and sharing experiences like this is, uh, is incredibly helpful um, and making sure that the private sector and the public sector are together and, and having an opportunity to compare notes. Um, we'll uh, move to the next uh, to the next panel, which will bring in the part Colin will facilitate. Um, I'll ask our, our, our official sector uh, members from the authorities uh, who've been on this panel. So uh, Francesca, Catherine. Kenneth, Alejandro, and Chang Chung to stay until the end because there's a number of questions uh, which it would be great if you could could answer. Um, but I'd really like uh, both the private and public sectors to have an opportunity to answer questions together so we can hear uh, from both sets of stakeholders. Um, so if uh, you guys could remain uh, in the event, um, we'll come back for questions right at the end. Um, but next, uh, over to Colin, who's going to bring in the private sector attendees. Uh, Colin, over to you. Well, thank you, Tom. Well. Uh... Well, very exciting to hear to the, you know, public sector, you know, colleagues speaking about how data has enabled the use of the stuff and red tech. Uh, for this panel, as Tom mentioned, uh, we have invited uh, the public sector participants to join us to share with us from their perspective uh, how the technologies uh, have been able to apply to the, you know, uh, regulatory side. And uh, of course, we will also look at, at another driver which is COVID, how COVID has, you know, impact on the adoption of, you know, sub and Red Hat, you know, solutions. Well, um, for this panel, uh, I, 
I will start off by, you know, uh, inviting uh, each of the panelists to give a kind of a, a simple introduction of their respective, you know, area of, of expertise and then uh, explain to us what are the key drivers in their respective areas for adopting Red Hat and SwiftTap solutions. Well, perhaps I can start off with uh, Joanne from Visa Software. Joanne? Thanks, Colin. And yeah, hi, I'm Joanne Horgan from Visor Software. And Visor is the leading provider of subtech solutions for data collection for supervisors. So we work with about 25 regulators around the world and the likes of Bank of England, uh, APRA, MAS, um, Bank of Canada, et cetera. Um, I guess what we find, you know, we work with, you know, I mentioned some, some larger regulators who also work in, in Africa and the Middle East, um, Caribbean, so with, with regulators of various sizes. Um, and what we find the main drivers, you know, regardless of, of size or maybe stage that, that they're on in their subject journey, um, typically drivers are around improved efficiency and agility um, and, and also better insight into the, into the data that's collected. So I think, you know, some of the attendees have already, the panelists have already mentioned that. Um, and what I mean by that, the, you know, the efficiency and agility in terms of how data is, is received and collected. Um, so we see a lot of regulators now maybe moving away from this idea of template aggregate data into more granular data and also trying um, a very much push scenario from firms on a scheduled basis into maybe something a little bit more real time um, and, and the ability maybe to pull data from, from regulated institutions. So, you know, we've done a, a project recently, for example, in, in, um, in Ghana with the Bank of Ghana, where they implemented our web portal, which is a normal way of, of collecting data, but also API for, for data collection. And they're collecting granular loan level, deposit level data and in, investment data from all their banks uh, via API. Um, and one of the key, um, one of the key drivers there was really um, so that they could get these insights on a more timely basis, they could they could use the data they get, um, not just not just looking at aggregated data, but looking at really the granular data, getting that into an analytics environment um, very quickly after it's collected and validated, and not having that delay maybe um, and lack of efficiency where you had in the past a lot of manual um, intervention required. Um, so yeah, I would say the main driver still that we see would be efficiency, agility, um, uh, and but also the the speed at which you can use that data and which it's usable, um, because that's been a challenge in the past. Well, thank you, Joanne. Next, can I uh, ask uh, Leo of uh, Ratnosis to also uh, brief us on on your on your area of work? Hi everyone, I'm uh, Leo Labase. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Ratnosis. Um, our mission is to radically transform the relationship between regulators and, and regulated firms. So we are really pleased by this invitation from the FSB uh, to this workshop on, on subtech and, and reg tech. And doubly so because uh, not only are we investing in that technology, uh, but also we are big believers in looking at subtech and reg tech as two perspectives uh, on the same problem. So the choice to bring both of, of them under the spotlight um, is particularly relevant to us. Uh, so for those who, who don't know us, uh, our solution is a, is a comprehensive software platform that has been purpose-built to transform uh, the financial industry's regulatory reporting framework. So effectively, we operate as a platform between, on the one hand, uh, regulators and, and other industry bodies, such as standard setting organizations, and on the other hand, regulated firms, um, and we leverage technology and the power of, of open source software in particular to fully digitize the regulatory data collection framework. Uh, so we provide regulators and firms a common language so they can communicate in a safe, transparent and, and truly digital way. Now, we, we believe that nowhere more so than in the regulatory data collection process is the shared pain point between regulators and firms felt so acutely. Uh, so on the one hand, it's the difficulty for firms to get a handle on the accuracy, completeness, timeliness of their data reporting. And on the other hand, for the regulators, it's the difficulty to communicate precisely their data needs and therefore to collect and analyze data of high quality and, and comparability. Uh, and the silver lining in, in all of this, uh, which, uh, you know, directly answering to the, the, the driver question, is that the technological solution to that data collection problem are also shared. And they've been well identified in the, the FSB report. It's greater use of, of cloud technology, 
uh, of API, microservices, um, and, and uh, to, to some extent, machine learning as well. But also, what's good news is that both sides have a self-interest in improving on the status quo. Um, you know, collecting higher quality data for regulators and improving efficiency and, and, and cost reduction uh, for firms. So the fact that we have a demand-led driver on both sides uh, is probably a very strong predictor that these advances will happen, uh, in our view. Um, so it's a question of, of when, not if. Thank you, Leo. And uh, next, can I invite uh, Tulip from Leap Expert? Thank you, Colin. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chip Lai. I'm based in Hong Kong for Leap Expert. And uh, we, using the power of cloud computing and APIs, enable uh, market participants, uh, regu regulated uh, institutions to communicate with their clients and external parties on their preferred personal messenger. So that could be WhatsApp, WeChat, Line, etc. Uh, we have designed and patented our own federated messaging orchestration platform, which enables, for instance, bank employees to use enterprise tools such as Microsoft Teams, uh, Slack, to communicate with any personal messenger. And really, it's solving the challenges that are inherent right now, particularly through the pandemic times, where all this critical business and client information is uh, not visible, both to the regulators and both to the institutions themselves and the enterprises. They're all kept on personal messaging applications or devices. Now, one of the problems also already mentioned is uh, uh, information governance and data privacy, obviously uh, personal identifying information. Is the data properly classified, available and retained within a bank secure environment? Uh, typically not if it's on a personal messenger. In addition, obviously, uh, the communication has to be stored and monitored and produced when and required for supervisors, uh, regulatory authorities and for legal and audit uh, purposes. So, it's critical uh, communication data that enterprises uh, don't have at the moment. Uh, in terms of the critical part is em empowering employees. So not just for regulatory and compliance purposes. We want employees at banks, for example, to deliver the best possible experience. So you're not forcing clients to use bank communication channels, which are typically emails, websites, uh, bank applications, call centers, but they're using their own preferred messenger, WeChat, WhatsApp, Line, Telegram, and so forth. And conversely, the bank employees are no longer using their personal messengers, even though most financial services do not allow communication to clients or even amongst colleagues on private personal messengers, it still occurs. And if you look at an incident two weeks ago where a top US bank had to let go of two of their senior executives for use of private messenger. So this is the kind of challenges that we're trying to solve with uh, RegTech, uh, our platform and the drivers. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Chilip. Uh, next, can I invite uh, Pascal Nisri from uh, Czech? Yeah, hi, you hear me? Hi, uh, I'm Pascal Nizri. Uh, I've been working in the financial industry for 20 years as a managing director for HSBC in many global and country roles. Uh, and I've co-founded Czech, a digital identity leader, providing secure end-to-end -end solutions to enable financial institutions to perform KYC for individuals in 30 seconds, KYB for corporates in five minutes, with all the features like automatic company unwrapping and new bills discoveries globally, for 350 million businesses, smart AML solutions with native language processing, uh, identity and verification solutions, uh, as well as data portability and privacy and continuous update of KYC and all, all of that working across 20 countries. So that's in a nutshell uh, about Czech. And to your question uh, about um, the main drivers of RegTech, I think there has been many regulation for years aimed at preventing money laundering, sanction evasion, tax evasion, tourist financing, all of that. And they have always required tools to support them. 
But I think over the last few years, we've seen even more focus on right tech solution. And when you look at the financial action task force report, the guidance reports from last year, that pushed quite a lot for remote onboarding and interaction solutions. Um, and with many regulators across the world echoing this, you know, with HTMA, MAS and all. And beyond the regulation, of course, most institutions around the world have also been pushing for very strong digital agendas to improve customer experience, to reduce cost, all of that. So when I look at that, I think RegTech is a key enabler to all of the above, you know, regulatory compliance, customer experience, cost management. And of course, it's even more paramount in a COVID world, uh, hence probably why we have seen ourselves quite a lot more demand for our solution this year, uh, especially in the corporate KYB space. Back to you, please. Thank you very much. Lastly, can I invite uh, Kimo of FNA to uh, Neslo? Uh, what's your area of expertise and the drivers that you see in your respective area? Thanks a lot, Colin, and uh, great to be here. Um, so my name is Kimo Soramaki. I'm the founder and um, CEO of FNA. FNA stands for Financial Network Analytics. Uh, we develop um, technology software for um, more the analytics side of SubTech. So some of the previous uh, uh, speakers were talking about data collection. Uh, so we, in a way, we um, um, start to get the there is data, and uh, now we want to get some insights, new insights out of it. Uh, understanding the connectedness, uh, uh, move from um, from manual to automated analytics, or move from uh, periodic to more real time uh, analytics. So automate those processes of uh, of uh, developing different applications and, and use cases across uh, central banks and um, and financial market infrastructures around the world, like uh, um, Central Bank of Colombia or Hong Kong Monetary Authority or Bank of England, for example. We've been doing a lot of simulations of, uh, of their um, um, payment systems. Um, I think as on actually the reason I, I founded the company in the first place, so I, I used to work at central banks at the, at the Bank of Finland, the ECB and, and uh, uh, New York Fed. So the reason I actually started up uh, FNA was because I saw that uh, after the financial crisis post Lehman, there was going to be a lot of uh, new granular data available for central bank supervisors. Um, and I didn't see um, like there are a lot of uh, technology analytics uh, um, expertise, how to operationalize this data and into applications. Uh, so that, that was uh, the reason I set up the company in the first place was to build this, this type of technology. So I think this um, availability of data is a, is a big driver. Um, um, granular loan level databases, the micro data that was mentioned before, payments data, um, data on uh, trade repository data, sort of uh, very transaction level large data sets. Uh, but I think also um, open data sets. So there's more and more data available online. Uh, we just recently uh, launched um, uh, G20 Monitor. Uh, so it's at g20monitor.com, uh, which was um, um, our response to the BIS and uh, saw the uh, G20 presidency challenge of uh, building technology to monitor the global financial system and economic system. Um, it includes a large number of different monitors, mainly using open data sets to, to, uh, to see like, what kind of insights we can get actually from the data that is openly available uh, by, by supranational institutions, by data vendors. Uh, there, there's lots of it, uh, which I think that there's lots of opportunities to combine it with, uh, with, with, uh, with your own data sets. And I think that was also mentioned before that a lot of value is, is, uh, is created by putting data sets together. Uh, uh, building large knowledge graphs so that you can have uh, these type of uh, insights uh, easily available to yourself. Uh, I think the other driver is uh, the um, increased complexity and the interconnectedness. Um, so that was something that the last financial crisis taught us uh, that, hey, the world is interconnected, everyone is connected to Lehman in some way, and that can cascade into systemic failures. I think we have uh, again been reminded with COVID that, hey, the world is uh, Supply chains, the supermarkets are still empty in the UK, uh, partly because of supply chain problems. Uh, so that everything is interconnected, this is just in time manufacturing, uh, the trade flows, uh, everything is interconnected, everything. We need to understand this, this better. Um, it's also more robust. Um, and at the same time, I think in the last 10 years, we've had this revolution of artificial intelligence and machine learning, that there are just more expectations from the society that also the supervisors, regulators uh, take advantage of, of these technologies that allow you to get a much better, better view of the world. Um, and these technologies are now available, so, so um, these are also creating opportunities. So I think that's the nice thing that come here together today. Thank well, you. Thank, 
thank you very much, Kimo. Well, uh, certainly, I think it's very excited to to learn from all these panelists that uh, the public sector have been offering a lot of creative, you know, solutions to help up with, uh, you know, regulatory and and supervisory functions. And uh, next, I'd like to turn to turn to COVID. And I think a, a general observation is that uh, COVID seems to have accelerated the pace of adoption of technology. Uh, not sure whether that uh, also happens for tap or red tap solutions, and um, what what will be kind of you know tools or, or services that are uh, most you know in demand. Uh, perhaps I can first uh, uh, ask Joanne. Uh, uh, have you been seeing any change in the demand for 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 red tap services in the market since COVID? Yeah, I think we have. I mean, we, we've seen, you know, I mentioned we work with supervisors. We, we also work um, with some, some banks in, in, um, in providing reg tech solutions as well. And what we've noticed um, during COVID is that, you know, in some cases, initially, there's probably a little bit of a slowdown. There's, you know, everybody had to stop and just get business as usual operating. Um, but, you know, once, once that initial shock lifted, um, what a lot of supervisors and probably bank staff noticed was, you know, they had to get used to this remote way of working and maybe some of the previous manual processes that they relied upon, um, you know, s simple things such as the, the sign off for data being, being submitted to the regulator. Um, they, they can't keep doing that manually. Um, I think it's, it's probably highlighted to a lot of people that those manual processes that we have um, that we maybe got used to in some cases just just won't work in, in a remote um, in a remote world i guess but also with with the volume and the complexity of data that's being requested now so um you know a lot of regulators put the brakes on certain things to give banks um or the financial institutions a little bit of a um a breather uh, they, they may have you know maybe paused some projects etc or, or delayed some uh, new initiatives but then on the other hand there were there were new data collections it was new new requests coming out for data um to to deal with deal with covid so um, I think what we've seen is there's definitely an increased demand. I think that the type of people are looking for now, um, cloud, I know in the, in the, in the FSB report there, for example, that there's some concerns about cloud um, in, in terms of where data is stored. I, I think in the private sector, it's probably a little bit, you know, it's probably a little bit more advanced in terms of the, the level of comfort with that. Um, it does potentially have a, a risk as we all know, cybersecurity and data um, privacy, etc. But um, I think there's been huge leaps in, in even in the last nine months um, in terms of the, the types of security that's available in the cloud. So I, I do see that um, on the reg tech side, there has been more of a demand for um, for cloud services um, for for kind of outsourcing, not to other humans, but maybe more to um, technology. Some of the the processes that people use for supervisory reporting, for example. Um, and I also see, you know, one of one of the things that that we've noticed as well is that, uh, you know, while technology has increased, it's it's not a it's not a silver bullet. And one of the things that people have got, got to get used to is the the change in ways of working, um, and the change in how maybe supervisors and financial institutions even uh, interact. So some of those on-site inspections that that may previously have happened in person, um, they're now having to happen over you know channels like so, such as this um and that's another area that we see maybe some more demand arising in, in, the, in the coming um months and years you know in, in sort of communication between supervisors and um supervised institutions moving away from sort of email letters you know visits in person um and making that communication a little bit more um digital uh, essentially so i think that's that's another area can see a change coming. I think on the on the data collection, I just to speak to that for a minute. Um, there's been a, a def, I think, increase in innovation and maybe in collaboration as well. Um, you know, these these events have uh, have moved to to a situation where we can have lots more people collaborate a lot more easily um, across time zones, etc. And people are more open to that now. So we, we are seeing that. You know, initiatives like in in the UK, for example, digital regulatory reporting, and you know, looking at how um, how data is going to be modelled, how data standards are going to be used in future, that, that seems to be getting a lot more traction now. Um, and I think part of that is is due to the, maybe everybody being, being forced to be more collaborative a little bit, um, but also just this, this acceptance of um, us all connecting and collaborating in a, in a, in a global uh, pandemic. It's, it's kind of brought people together a little bit, I think. 
Thank you, Joanne. Well, I think definitely uh, uh, COVID in a way kind of providing a very potent motivation to change the way how we behave. And, and some of these changes could probably be permanent. So next, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, how about Leo? Do you have the same observations? Yes, no, absolutely. I, I completely concur to that. Uh, it's a classic case of uh, a shock led drive to adopt new technology, uh, which is, you know, we've seen that pattern over centuries. Um, so if we draw a parallel with our daily lives, COVID has demonstrated how much digitization was in fact already embedded in our, in our lives uh, when the world went uh, virtual almost overnight. Um, and what was interesting was it was not so much a case of you know, quickly, suddenly having to develop new technologies, but really adopting existing ones, you know, cloud, uh, Zoom or WebEx, um, virtual desktop, uh, you know, all mature technologies, um, you know, and it's just the context changed uh, and, and it, it drove adoption. And I think, you know, the same can be, can be said of, of technology to address regulatory and supervisory challenges. And effectively, by, by preventing regulators and firms to sit in the same room, so to speak, uh, for potentially prolonged period of, period of time, um, it highlighted how antiquated uh, the regulatory data collection framework currently is, for instance. Um, so if I draw on, on one you know, recent example, um, uh, ESMA had to delay and put waivers in place uh, to the rollout of SFTR earlier in the, in the year in the face of, of the, the pandemic. And this was absolutely the right decision uh, because this was a, a watershed regulatory change for the securities financing market. But this puts into a very crude light how automated data collection processes are, in fact, anything but and this sort of event, I think, drives the industry to recognize that we need a regulatory data collection framework uh, that is fit for the digital age, uh, that is both more robust, uh, more cost effective. And uh, like, in other words, if this is not a framework in 2020 that can be operated fully virtually by people sitting at a desk in you know, their kitchen, kitchen or bedroom, then I think we have to take a long and hard look in the mirror and ask ourselves, how robust that framework actually is if people have to be in the same room to make it happen. So I think as much as, as COVID-19 acted as, a, as that catalyst to accelerate that digital transformation in our daily lives, uh, we would urge public authorities globally to seize on, on that current circumstances as an opportunity to, uh, to embrace innovation. Uh, over to you. Good news. Uh, certainly, I think the, the, the impact of COVID actually penetrates every aspect of our life. Certainly. Well, uh, in, in terms in the area of data analysis, Kimo, have you been seeing uh, increased, you know, usage or adoption of, you know, uh, red hat solutions? Um, yeah, so maybe maybe also coming back to the previous question a little bit, uh, just add two things so that uh, I, I think like this COVID and remote working situation has enabled us to uh, share information much more efficiently. Uh, just as an example, I'm, we do a lot of training on Subtech, um, and because um, at this stage uh, there's a lot of interest in learning what everyone else is doing, um, and uh, we've been doing different types of projects for, for several years with different different uh, central banks. So in, in February, I did a training together with SEMLA, the, um, the Latin American um, Central Bank Association, uh, for 25 people on, on, uh, in Jamaica in person. Uh, we redid that training um, maybe a month ago for 200, over 200 people uh, remotely. So like this is a tenfold increase in the participation because the costs of participating are so much lower participating. And this was a five day course, three hours a day. Uh, so it was not like a, just a one hour event. But I think that has allowed us to learn so much better from each other uh, because we are remote and we can jump from here to like the next meeting in a, in a matter of, uh, of minutes. Um, and the other thing that's on, on the interest, uh, so I think the biggest interest currently is, I think, is in this learning, um, learning what can be done. I think that is a big interest. But looking at the, the G20 monitor, so we cover monitors there in, uh, in most um, um, aspects of the BIS uh, subtech taxonomy. And when I look at Google Analytics, uh, what are people actually going and uh, which type of monitors are they going to see? There are top three are um, uh, on misconduct analysis, AML and uh, CFD uh, to, 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 to address uh, analytics around the money laundering. And the second one is uh, on credit risk, because of course, uh, the, at the back of the uh, 
COVID crisis and all the trouble for the uh, the corporations. There probably be a lot of um, um, credit uh, defaults at the back of that. And the third one is uh, is a macro prudential and uh, financial stability um, sort of dashboards. So, so those are the top three interests that uh, that there are currently. Thank you very much, Kim. Well, it seems that uh, COVID does, you know, have a similar impact of, you know, prompting regulators or, or even the regulate, regulated entities to, to adopt more, the red time should have solutions. Well, of course, uh, for this solution, I think the ultimate objective is to meet, you know, regulator objectives or obligations. So certainly the regulators would have, would have, a, would have a role to, to pay in terms of, you know, facilitating, you know, uh, the adoption of these solutions. And so there may be a, a kind of a policy angle at it. Uh, on this, uh, uh, I would like to to ask the the rest of, of the two panelists about how they see the, the the policy, the regulators policy, the public policy, can help in support you know the adoption of these new red or suited solutions. Can uh, Philip first share your view with us? Um, thanks, Colin. Um, just a quick point on, on the previous uh, um, discussion about the pandemic. So, just uh, as Joanne said, our fellow panelists at the beginning, um, that has driven a huge increase in electronic communication. So, just statistics, Bloomberg announced 50% increase in messages this year. Microsoft Teams has grown by 300% to April in the last six months. So. We've seen a huge amount of data and communications, but even more impressive is the personal messengers. Uh, WhatsApp announced 100 billion messages a day currently, all on private uh, personal messengers and 2 billion active users. So that definitely has fueled uh, an exponential demand for reg tech and uh, regulatory technology uh, to start with. Back to you, uh, obviously, your question about uh, policy. So the fact that we're all here uh, is, is amazing. So Colin, and obviously the FSB, to facilitate the kind of collaboration and discussion, that is, is, is one very important point. From what I saw in the, um, one of the graphs in the recent report FSB released on supervisory and regulatory technology is that of the respondents on the use of uh, RegTech tools by uh, authorized institutions, uh, the authorities responded that 97% of those uh, institutions are using RegTech tools. But ironically, on the other question, does your authority encourage the use of RegTech? 53% uh, of respondents says, authorities don't encourage the uh, use of reg tech. So there is a dichotomy. The regulated institutions are using reg tech uh, as part of their daily business. Uh, certain authorities are not encouraging it. Now, whether this is uh, purely a lack of communication or awareness, there may be uh, uh, many issues here, but um, this is a good stepping stone, a good open discussion for obviously um, how to improve uh, policy and an encouragement and uh, financial conduct authority as well uh, when they're commenting about market abuse in times of coronavirus, which was uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, the abuses and offensive hasn't uh, are remaining constant, uh, but the way that the risk is coming out has changed. So surveillance has to change. So they are encouraging, obviously, the, the view that reg tech has to go along uh, with the uh, change in the circumstances that we're experiencing. Uh, and back closer to, obviously, my close regulator, the HKMA, hot off the press, you released the Harnessing the Power RegTech on Monday at the Hong Kong FinTech Week. So we're very proud to be one of the uh, survey respondents to that. And HKMA, and through my experience in the last 10 years, have played a very proactive role in facilitating adoption, uh, bringing the community together, where it's sandboxes, where it's uh, events, circulars, and of, of course, eight virtual bank licenses. So virtual banks or remote, no physical bricks and mortar banks, enables the use of cloud computing APIs and reg tech. And, and even one step further, the, the collaboration uh, and the education uh, as part of the FinTech Association of Hong Kong's uh, regulatory technology reg tech committee since 2017. I've seen how you know we're a very supportive and open community here, and we have many 
market participants, authorized institutions, as well as regulators and educators that join. So uh, policy does help, but having the regulators and the authorities and joining in and supporting it actively and promoting it does in increase the awareness at the very least, but more likely increase the collaboration. Thank you, Trillip. I, I think uh, the mm -hmm. FSB Fin Group is uh, kind of, you know, per exactly performing this this role in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, uh, bridging the gap and uh, getting to know what the industry is doing and see how they can, you know, better cooperate in the industry in enhancing stability. And last but not least, I uh, uh, understand in terms of policy, the AML and the KYC is, is another quite heavily regulated uh, areas. So public policy can be particularly important in terms of, you know, enabling banks to adopt creative new solutions. So uh, Pascal, can you also share with us your views and observations on how public policy can help with, you know, adoption of new solutions? Yeah, thank you, Colin. So first of all, I would echo a lot uh, what I've heard before from my fellow panelists. Uh, obviously, COVID forced all the businesses to interact even more remotely than ever before. So I think, as Grant said, you know, after a period of uncertainty this year in March, April, when most financial institutions in the world were very focused on how to survive, focus on their business continuity plan and how Zoom is working, then we entered the period where because of social distancing, closure of physical branches, all of that, it became even more of an imperative for most organizations to fast track digital onboarding, KYC and ML initiatives. And to those point, a lot of time, those uh, initiatives were relying on existing solution even before COVID. So it's not that we invented uh, as a rec tech community something new overnight, but it's just that suddenly it became even more of an imperative. So if anything, as you said, Colin, uh, COVID accelerated and increased the demand for rec tech solution. And for us, we've seen, especially in a, uh, in a space of remote corporate on KYB, uh, artificial intelligence based, IDNV and KYC, all of that often to support SME's access to funding and the rebound of economies, you know, uh, and I'm happy to chat more about that uh, offline. Um, but obviously, when we look at how all of that is supported by uh, policymakers, and that's a very important question. I think um, it's very important, of course, despite the obvious need for digital onboarding and remote interaction, uh, many financial institutions often uh, wait for strong policies and uh, regulations to clearly say, that it's okay to use new technologies, and sometimes they even wait for it to be mandated. Therefore, for us, uh, for Czech, uh, the digital entity and eKYC solution, uh, policymakers have a big role to play to keep formalizing such policies and guidance, you know, supporting tech. So, of course, I mentioned earlier the FATF guidance report for 2019, which really helped a lot, or the FSB report, or uh, what was just mentioned before, you know, the power of tech report issued by HKMA that we're also a, a response participant and it's a great document. So thanks again for that. Uh, but I think often it's helpful if you can go even further and support the adoption of RecTech solution by having policymakers working hand in hand with governments, with financial institutions, with fintechs to lead the way for all parties and drive a faster adoption. Um, and what I mean by that is it's not, it's uh, over and beyond some of those guidance documents and research and all. If it can, if we can see some more uh, working group and collaboration opportunities between the various parties in the, in the system, that could really make a big difference. Uh, if I look at KYC, Colin, to your point, uh, for instance, it'd be nice to see even more international collaboration efforts uh, across countries to maximize, for instance, opportunities for financial institutions and citizens uh, um, in the context of KYC utilities, for instance, across countries and industries, as opposed to sometimes some more niche activities that we've been seeing or that we've been participating ourselves to. So there's a huge role to play, uh, and uh, but there's already a lot happening. We've been interacting a lot with uh, HKMA and other regulators in the world, and, uh, and I'm very uh, happy that it's already progressing that fast. But uh, a lot of opportunities for us all in uh, 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. Well, I, I think, uh, well, thank all the panelists for, for sharing your very invaluable, invaluable uh, insights and views. I, I think COVID certainly has accelerated the pace for adoption of technology and likewise in the red tech and subtech areas. And I think for, for regulators, uh, uh, we, we have all sorts of contingency plan to deal with different, you know, contingency scenarios, flooding, uh, earthquake, you know, outage of essential services. But I think none of those that we have experienced before is comparable to COVID in terms of pervasiveness. And um, 
unfortunately, this kind of imaginary scenario uh, has become a reality, and 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 we we certainly need to catch up in, in this specific area. And uh, and and the kind of change that we've seen may may not be short term, and it, it there may not be kind of a reversal, so to speak. It can permanent permanently change the way in which uh, in which we operate. So I think uh, uh, regulators and supervisors, uh, on one hand, should kind of you know facilitate the process of you know adoption of these you know new technologies. On the other hand, we we certainly need to pay attention to the risk as well. On this, uh, I think uh, FSV Fin uh, should certainly continue to play a, a role in this to update and inform members and uh, bring together the industry and the regulators uh, to come up with, uh, you know, kind of uh, conducive and productive solutions. Well, I think uh, this section ends here and uh, I will pass it back to to Tom to to kick off the Q&A section, perhaps. Thank you. Thank you, Colin, and thank you to everybody uh, who participated uh, in that panel. That was really interesting. Um, so uh, this is the big moment where we go to Q and A. Um, there's already quite a few been written in the um, in the chat boxes. Um, I'll introduce a, a few of the questions and, and probably ask uh, an official sector and a, and a private sector person to respond uh, to each. Um, I'll go through some of the initial questions, uh, but Patrick will be keeping uh, an eye on the chat box, and I might ask Patrick uh, to introduce some more uh, if if we run out of questions. Uh, the first one, which has come up um, uh, with with thanks to the uh, to the Reserve Bank in South Africa. Um, they've asked about the role of public and private collaborations um, and how important those are in subtech development. Um, so I might go first to uh, to, to Kenneth in, in MAS, if that's okay. Uh, Kenneth, could you just give us your views on uh, the role of public sector, private sector collaboration in subtech? Oh, hi, hi. Sorry, I have, I have a bit of a problem with my uh, video right now, but let me let me try to, to give a response to that. So thanks very much for, for that question. Uh, well. Definitely, the, the easy answer is to say that uh, you know it, it is important to, to have that role uh, of, of both pub, uh, public and private, uh, you know, um, co coming together. And I guess how I would frame the response is to really think about you know where we left off at the end of our uh, uh, discussion amongst the supervisors, which is to say, you know, how, how do we actually uh, begin the journey, right? Uh, how 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 can we actually make a start uh, for for those of us here who are you know attending this uh, seminar and thinking. You know, how do I you know, get a start on my first project? How do I start to demonstrate value to my organization? So definitely, you have to take a look at a couple of factors, I would say. Uh, first, of course, to really look at the people, the mix. So, so to me, the answer is threefold. First, you need to look at the people, like what was mentioned earlier. What is the mix of uh, expertise that you have in your uh, organization? Uh, do you have, for example, uh, enough people you know, who, who understand the technology and the data science? Uh, if, if there's less of those people, you may want to, of course, reach out more to industry uh, and, 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 and so-called uh, get a better understanding of the solutions uh, that they have. I think some of the uh, uh, panelists today have shared some of their, their solutions, which are, of course, quite interesting. The second thing, of course, is to also look at the um, existing processes as well within the uh, organization. Uh, and again, this is a, an area where you know uh, it's useful to take a look and see, because ultimately many of the pain points that uh, we face uh, in, in our uh, uh, respective uh, supervisory uh, authorities in solving these data problems, they are quite deep set in many ways because uh, it's not just addressing, of course, one part of the data uh, value chain, if you will. It needs to actually work end to end in order for the value to actually be delivered to the supervisor. So to the extent that, uh, you know, uh, US supervisors, uh, you know, come across firms that actually can demonstrate that they can solve these pain points for you, sit down with them and really have a better understanding, ask them to explain to you how exactly they intend to solve the issues that are specific to your organization, and those, I think, will also be uh, good uh, collaboration partners. And of course, finally, uh, my, my point is also, I think, uh, in, in developing uh, supervisory technology solutions, we need to look at the platforms as well that we use. So, uh, of course, uh, 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 some uh, um, organizations like our Chinese colleagues, of course, I, I can imagine have very uh, sophisticated and advanced solutions. And, and uh, in the monetary authority as well, in, in Singapore, we are looking, of course, at uh, quite interesting uh, enterprise architecture uh, solutions that uh, I think are quite common in, in uh, uh, firms, tech firms. So, you know, we use DevOps pipelines, we use CICD processes and so on. And th those, of course, are of course all helpful. But if your organization is, uh, you know, uh, just uh, at, at the so-called early exploratory phase, then it's also useful to ask these um, organizations, uh, industry to see, you know, how can they actually help you to evolve your organization to a state where, you know, uh, 
given that supervisory uh, uh, concerns are ever evolving, how can a new concern, you know, uh, actually be better tackled using uh, supervisory technology? So that's, uh, yeah, my thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. That's great. Um, so um, I'll go to, um, to, to Claire uh, Mills from the Bank of England next, um, just to, to give her views on this, uh, perhaps including referring to the FSB report. Uh, and then after Claire has spoken, uh, we'll go to, uh, to Leo um, uh, from Regnesis, uh, who can give a private sector um, uh, view on this, if that's OK. So Claire first and then uh, Leo. Hi, thanks, Tom. Uh, I too can't seem to get my video kicking off either. So um, thank you. Um, I, I, Joanne Horgan from Visor mentioned that COVID had provided a spring, springboard for collaboration, which I, I do think is right. Um, it's always been challenging for, for regulators and authorities to collaborate with without being seen to favour specific products or organisations and, and thereby perhaps influencing competition. Um, the growing number of sandboxes, fintech incubators uh, that have been brought out by a number of um, authorities has definitely helped to open up the marketplace and encourage people to, to be talking to each other. And I think that's very much also helped the smaller firms, whereas uh, most organisations, especially uh, the, the more risk averse of, of central banks and uh, authorities would tend to go to the larger providers uh, of, uh, of technology. So I think that has definitely opened that up. I think there's also some really good examples um, and, and one we have had on proofs of contact uh, concept and, and the tech sprints where we, we've undertaken a digital regulatory reporting initiative uh, with our sister regulator, the Financial Conduct Authority. Um, and I think that really showed what can happen and what can be achieved when a slightly lowered and all the different elements come and collaborate together. And I think that has worked very well. I think therefore the pressure is pre pretty much on the central banks and authorities to, to push that envelope and risk appetite and thinking about working with a broader range of fintech firms and the smaller firms to really help move things forward and, and more quickly. Thank you, Claire. Uh, Leo, uh, what do you think about public private partnerships? Hi, thank you, Tom. No, this is absolutely, absolutely critical. Uh, collaboration is is really a key word, and it was identified in the in the FSB report. Uh, it starts by re recognizing that regulators, policymakers, uh, recognizing the challenge that they face in supervising, monitoring financial markets effectively. Uh, that's the exact mirror image of the challenge that is faced by uh, financial institutions, regulated firms, in, in complying. Um, and you know, just to talk about uh, the data collection, uh, we would contend that the increased availability uh, of and granularity of data, which was you know the topic of, of the first panel, um, it's of little use uh, without greater standardization from the bottom up. And if you look at standardization and harmonization, you know, beyond technological solutions like cloud API, this is the sort of challenge that requires the old fashioned collaboration between regulators and, and firms. Um, you know, so it's, it's people effectively working together. Um, sadly, I think it's a fact, this, this collaboration is a fact that has been a little bit lost uh, after a decade of, of regulatory reform across the G20 that started from you know, a massive crisis and therefore started from an adversarial perspective. Uh, and from that point of view, I think neutral subtech and, and rec tech solution providers they have a role to play uh, in educating uh, public authorities, you know, in events such as today on the possibilities offered by technology to address both sets of, of challenges together. Um, and I heard the, uh, the, the very um, uh, relevant comment about, um, you know, trading a fine line because of competition concern. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier that um, you know, uh, as far as our approach is concerned, we operate as a platform between regulators, industry bodies, and, and regulated firms. And in particular, we leverage the power of open source software. And I think open source software is the middle way into enabling, you know, to alleviate that th those concerns about uh, about competition. And in particular, we would advocate uh, the use of shared open source software between regulators and, and firms uh, in the area of, of data collection to align data collection expectations in a way that no PDF or, or guidance ever could. Um, just to, to, to draw some recent example, we had the opportunity to present 
as a platform last year to the European Commission. And, and on that basis, they are now going ahead with a project to develop the upcoming pan-European EMEA reporting regime update directly as machine executable rules. Uh, in other words, as software, not PDF. So this is an example of you know, a top-down you know, collaboration with the private sector and a top-down led uh, move towards uh, you know, a digital transformation which is also an answer to the, the other question, which is, you know, what is the, uh, what is the role that, that public uh, authorities have to play? Definitely they can drive, you know, if not mandate, but they can really, uh, they can be driver for that, that change. Um, so finally, I would say over the next two years, national regulators, uh, they can seize up that, on that unique opportunity to fully roll out, for instance, the CPMI IOSCO, uh, data harmonization recommendation under a similar paradigm. Um, and the potential prize across regulators and regulated firms is, is huge, provided that this is done collaboratively and, and by embracing the latest subtech sub and rectech innovation. Thank you, Leo. Um, so uh, I think a question that we all, all knew was coming, um, and uh, I might um, ask uh, Chang Chung uh, and then either Claire or Damien, who, uh, who did the report, and then perhaps Joanne uh, from from uh, Visor to, to respond to this. So the question is um, from uh, fellow regulators uh, who are asking, how do we get started, basically? Um, and uh, I think uh, the, the question uh, which uh, has come up, uh, and perhaps um, I'll, I'll put this to you first, uh, Chang Chung, is what's the first step you would recommend people take to start working on subtech? Um, based on uh, obviously China, where you're you're quite a, a, an experienced and an advanced user of subtech. So, what's the first step you'd recommend other regulators take to get started on subtech? Well, from our experience uh, in development of our API system, firstly, we have to identify the most. Uh, uh, I mean, the pinpoint in our uh, in our supervision. Uh, for example, for us, we have to we identify the 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 most uh, uh, will be benefited area that will be cost reduction, because we uh, for the uh, on site supervision we actually use a lot of uh, a great amount of manpower and time, and both the uh, supervisors and the supervised institutions need to spend. A great amount of resources to prepare and analyze and uh, analyze data and identify suspicious transactions one by one. So that was very uh, cost uh, consumption. So, firstly, we have to identify that area could be uh, could could have some lot of cost reduction. Secondly, we have to identify the areas. Uh, which we could increase the cap cap capabilities. Like in China, uh, our capability in terms of the regulation uh, on the payment transactions, especially the on the online gambling and the money laundering and uh, and other illicit transactions is very popular in Chinese online uh, payment service sector. So if we could develop uh, a API system, then we can increase dramatically uh, our capability to identify all those illicit transactions. For example, based on the data we have already collected from the payment service providers and the commercial banks, we have identified those people uh, use the crypto assets to uh, do illicit transactions and also transfer money and break the capital management measures from transfer money from uh, mainland China to other territories and other jurisdictions. So that's uh, the second uh, step we, we, we should uh, uh, explore. And uh, of course, uh, <clears throat> uh, subsequently, we, we should uh, uh, identify those areas we could improve the supervision coverage. That means uh, the system could break through the limitations of traditional supervision and, uh, and achieve full coverage and penetrating supervision of payment transactions. Uh, we, because you know, the supervisor using traditional approach has to face 
supervise the entities one by one and cope with segmented data and information. Instead, based on our, you know, the sub, uh, uh, the sub tech, and the, we could shift the supervisory approach from institutional oriented to behavioral oriented, covering all aspects of the payment industry. So we can extend our coverage of uh, supervision. So, I mean, before we can develop a system to uh, to to do this uh, sub tech, uh, we have to identify those areas we can improve uh, the supervision. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you, Chang Chang. That's really helpful. Um, so uh, perhaps I'll go to, to Joanne um, and then to uh, Claire or Damien uh, as they prefer. Um, so uh, Joanne, um, what what would your advice be to uh, to a possible future client who wants to get started on uh, on subtech? Well, well, I'm, I'm not going to say go go buy technology. I think that's uh, you know I probably should say that, but I think. Um, Chang Chun made a good point there. I think the first step is is decide what you want to improve. I mean, what's your biggest pain point? What's the the area that you're um, that you're having the biggest problem with? I think you know that there's there's a huge amount of of technology out there, and, and other people have mentioned that it's not new. Cloud APIs, uh, machine learning, etc. Um, but you've got to look at your jurisdiction and and the makeup of your just jurisdiction and what makes sense for you. So is it um, is it the, the the quality of the data you're collecting, the timeliness of it? Is it the, um, you know, do you have good data, but you just don't have analysis on it? Uh, is, is there a lot of unstructured data you need to look at? So I would say, you know, the first step is, yes, decide what you want to, you know, what, what you want to improve and how you're going to measure that, because I think that's that's something that we, you know, one thing that we see a little bit with, with um, even with the report, we talk about, you know, improved efficiency and agility and things like that, but we, we rarely see a very measurable, um, I think outcomes uh, from from this. So, you know, I think that's one thing that that would be quite important. You know, we're not necessarily talking about cost reduction here, but how do we measure that we've we've made an improvement? Um, so that would be the first thing. Sort of decide what your outcome you want your outcome to be and what you want to measure. Um, and then the second thing would be to get. You know, you really need to have a a a vision and a strategy for this because it needs that kind of top down. Um, uh, I'd say buy in from from the board uh, and the governor maybe of, of the central bank. So. Um, I think there are two things you need to have that um, that maybe you know start small, start with one thing that you want to improve, look at that area, um, and then you know don't be you know I guess one thing I'd say as well is is you know feel free to to reach out to the likes of us or the likes of other people on this call for for um, you know just to talk because I think there is there's lots of there is lots of collaboration these days and I know that um, you know from the, from the private sector. There has been maybe in the past. Oh, they, they, you know, they just want to sell me something. Yeah, yes, maybe, maybe that's that's a. Um, I think if for, for some for some that's the way people operate. But I think there's a lot more collaboration that people are um, open to these days. Um, and you know, where where a solution is right, Claire mentioned this earlier. It might be a local, you know, it might be a local provider that's doing something that's just really niche and in your space, and maybe that's who you need to look at. So, you know, decide what your Problem is you want to solve, get the buy in from the top um, and then start doing your research into, you know, what kind of firms can help you, um, whether you want to develop in house capabilities or whether you want to go out to the market. But I think the technology comes after um, the the, uh, the problem being identified first. Thanks, John. That's really helpful. So, uh, Claire um, or, or Damien from MAS, uh, you uh, led the, uh, the FSB report. Uh, a question that a lot of fellow regulators have asked is uh, lots of different technology vendors. Uh, but limited uh, resources in the supervisory authorities. Uh, how do you pick who to partner with? Yeah, so maybe, uh, hi, this is Damien. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give a quick thought and, and Claire will probably have her views as well. So in fact, that, uh, I, I think I think the when we talk about pain points within a regulator, uh, there, there, there are really many, uh, in a sense. And the pain points are really from, uh, of course, urgent market needs itself. Uh, all the way to uh, efficiencies and, and manpower constraints that we all face, lah. In a sense, so so it, it is. I, I'm not sure whether or not it is something that, uh, uh, but it's something that we are we are doing within the MAs itself. It is about allowing that that hundred flowers to bloom, lah. In a sense, we are not taking a judgment with regards to specific technologies, whether they will work in the specific use cases or scenarios per se, but creating the uh, opportunities for all these various pockets of. Of, of trials and experiments within the regulatory community, uh, uh, within the MES in itself, 
uh, to to experiment and, and and from that point onwards we see whether or not are those technologies creating real value la. and then from that point how do we then scale uh, from uh, from those uh, uh, experiments to actual production I, I think from a regulator's perspective is probably trying to understand the technologies with all these different experiments and opportunities to to see what works and then and rather than attempting uh, to to uh, pin down to specific technologies and go big on them. So uh, maybe, Claire? Uh, thank you, Damien. I, there's not a huge amount I can have sensible advice that's been coming uh, from people. I think this is the, the bit I'd probably add is is the, the thing of not, just not trying to jump to the biggest thing first. I think Joanne mentioned start small. Um, it is definitely looking at what is the outcome you're trying to achieve? What is the problem? What's the problem? Um, showcase some of the things. So showcasing the art of the possible, which is looking at the proofs of concept that Damien's perhaps just mentioned and, um, and, and looking at, at how that can work. Fix the basics. You can gain a huge amount of credibility by helping supervision fix some of their really basic issues and problems. Um, and that'll help um, you gain that credibility further up uh, the chain to to perhaps where you can uh, achieve a little bit more budget uh, to look at the the bigger things that you want to fix going forward. But but proof of concepts definitely. We work on a an optimize and transform approach, and by that I mean the optimize is trying to fix things that uh, that with the data you already have, with some of the tools and some small tools, and be able to make those quick wins for supervision but with an eye to how you might want to start to transform. So your vision should have probably, I, I think, two parts to it. That optimise, the longer transform, but try and make your optimise be stepping stones to your longer, bigger picture. And that way you will gain perhaps credibility both with, super, with your supervisors and with your senior management to help with that investment. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Damien. Um, hugely valuable advice there um the next area of question so i, I think essentially there's, there's three themes which have emerged which we could probably cover in the rest of the questions so uh, the first area is on privacy um uh, the second area is on uh talent uh, and resources uh, and the third is on uh, data standards and particularly uh, the role of unstructured data um so perhaps to start uh, on privacy um i'll ask uh, alejandro in bank of canada to, to open uh, and then perhaps I'll go to uh, to Pascal uh, and to to Chilip to give uh, their views from the private sector. Uh, so um, Alejandro, perhaps you'd like to to open. Um, what do you think uh, the implications of uh, privacy are when uh, supervisors are using uh, big data, um, and how can we make sure that we are complying with the necessary privacy regulations whilst also making the best use of available data? I think it's a, it's an excellent question and a hard question. Um, I think one of the it depends on who you talk to. I think one of the benefits that that let's say we have is that we adopt a more macro prudential view of the let's say what's going on in the financial system, and for that sense, we don't really need to know any specific information, detailed information of of um of the let's say if we're looking at. That, uh, I guess one of the challenges is the micro data, right? So to the extent that you prevent all of the information that would disclose um, personal sort of or, or institution specific um, identifiers, you can get an understanding of what is sort of the, the level of risk, how it's changing without having any, any impact on privacy, right? So I guess one way to address this is to say, if, you, if you're able to um, use the Characteristics of the data, right? Without having the masking the identities identities of the the underlying sort of um, data set that allows you to get uh, draw insights, right? So that's one of the potential ways of addressing it. Um, uh, in terms of, um, I guess maybe privacy, another important maybe point to to highlight here is the importance of security, right? For those that are security and cyber, um, where you have that data, the standards that you have to to make sure that uh, the access to that data is not um, is not um, I guess it's protected at all costs, right? So that uh, the privacy is protected. That's a that's a key key aspect. So all of the cyber security policies and all of those are maybe fundamental infrastructure that you have to have in place so that when you analyze that data, the risk that, that it gets out is, is quite uh, lower, is fully mitigated, it's important. 
Um, but again, it's it's a very difficult question, and I, I'm not so sure um, uh, we have yet uh, uh, all of the answers. So, so maybe we want to stop there and see if uh, if that helps in any way. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, I mean, certainly, um, I remember when the uh, the EU uh, uh, data protection regulation, uh, the GDPR, came in. Uh, it was quite an effort in the Bank of England uh, to think about how we were complying with that. Um, and uh, uh, that was even when we probably weren't using that much uh, sensitive data. Um, and we've certainly been very keen, and it's been useful in COVID to start to use uh, alternative uh, data sources, including those actually from fintechs, uh, where we've we've been lucky to, to access information via fintechs, which has given us quite a different window into the economy. Um, so very uh, interesting uh, developments. Also, in terms of mortgage data as well, I think is another area where we've uh, we've, we've found some very interesting data sources. Um, so perhaps then to take a, a private sector view on this, mm. um, uh, Pascal uh, in, in yeah. Czech, you must think about uh, privacy all the time, given the nature of your business. Um, <laughs> how do you think we should navigate this as supervisors? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think it's obviously uh, a question we hear all the time, you know, data collection versus data privacy, because in the context of KYC and KYB, there's a lot of that happening, of course. So we all know there's been increasing regulation in the last 10, 20 years. And if you look now, it's ever more data and documents that financial institutions have to collect and compile in the context of KYC. It's like dozens, if not hundreds of them. And in, in a corporate KYC kind of context, it can take weeks or months for uh, like a multinational corporations to go through the KYB with the bank. So uh, sometimes all of that is, of course, raising questions about data privacy. How do you comply with GDPR regulation you just mentioned, but also all the brothers and sisters of that regulation around the world, CCPA and, and others in UAE and others. Um, but there are ways, uh, you know, for instance, you know, I check, uh, not only do we provide end-to-end -end type of KYC uh, and KYB solutions with automation and prefilling of info and all, but we do it in a way where the customers of the financial institutions are on power to own their data, you know, in a secure encrypted data wallet for the businesses and the individuals with all the appropriate consent management at the data point level uh, and all the security features, all that to enable the possibilities for the customer of the bank to consent to what they share with whom and then reuse their own data across business lines, uh, across countries and across financial institutions. And of course, all of that, back to what was said just before, um, all of that supported by appropriate data security and encryption standards so that, for instance, we don't see any data, any private data of the customers of our clients, of our financial institutions clients. So I believe personally that RecTech, KYC automation, etc., are not contradictory with data privacy imperatives. With the right solutions like ours or some others uh, and the customers at the center, this should not be a trade-off for financial institutions, but rather an opportunity to comply with regulation, reduce the cost, but also improve customer experience and empower their customers. Uh, and I'm happy to explain a bit more offline with whoever is interested about uh, what I mean by all this uh, reconciliation of those two opposite forces. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. Um, uh, Chilip, in, um, uh, in, in Hong Kong, um, uh, Leap Experts, um, you mentioned privacy actually in your remarks earlier. Um, what's your view on this issue? Um, so I see it as twofold. Um, one is obviously the, uh, the client data, so that critical information which is not accessible by the institution or regulators because the electronic communication is taken place outside of the administration or control of a financial services or a, a market participant. So that's the first part. So if you look at all the GDPRs and, you know, uh, as Pascal mentioned, California Consumer Privacy Act, and even going as far back as uh, HIPAA, I think that's uh, in the 90s, the US kind of health insurance. Um, first of all, having to identify and classify information. If you don't have any access to the information, have no visibility, what's been exchanged, ID cards, application forms, sales transaction data. If you have no visibility of that, that's already your hamstrung uh, uh, as a, a regulated institution. Um, prohibit, 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 I was going to read prohibited use of electronic messaging it, it is pretty much the standard policy, but you know that the hundreds of billions of personal messages that have been sent involve clients and banks and institutions. Um, that's a given. So, so you have that part where the information isn't available. It's not being retained according to the, the policies and years that are required by the, the local regulator or you know, under you know, GDPR. Also, the client doesn't have any access so if the client goes to the bank, hey, 
I've been chatting to your uh, my private banker, and I sent in some information with my ID and my and my family uh, passport. Can you uh, send that back to me? And uh, as a you know information request, and that's just not available because that was over WhatsApp, that was over WeChat. We don't have it, and your private banker has left to join another bank. I'm afraid, so we don't actually know what information you sent to us. So that's that situation, but also from a employee data privacy challenge. So some institutions we've seen have asked, if you're using these messages, you need to save it all into our server. So all your chats, uh, all your data, all your attachments, all your pictures, okay, fine. But I also use that to chat to my family, my friends, my colleagues, et cetera, and other people that have nothing to do with my business, but this is my WhatsApp or WeChat account. And that's the other challenge where the employee is like, I want to do business. I want to be in power to manage the relationship with my clients. I also need you as an institution to respect my privacy. So I can't just hand over all my personal chat information because you said one of those is a client. Um, so that's the employee side. So it is twofold, but the main part is to have it visible. Right now, the personal messaging apps, WhatsApp, WeChat, were designed to be social. They weren't designed to be enterprise grade, like the emails, the faxes, the phone calls, and all these collaboration tools. So we're in a position where we got about 6 billion active users of personal messenger, which is well over 80% of the population of uh, active uh, messenger accounts. So can we believe that all of that is personal chats and nothing to do with business or regulated entities? Obviously, um, just saying uh, prohibiting or prohibition isn't a policy. So having the access to the data is the first part. Uh, right now, most uh, institutions don't have access to that data. Thank you very much. It's really interesting. So uh, we are, we've got about uh, two or three minutes left. Um, I'm going to try and squeeze in two more questions. So uh, the first one is about um, how can we use unstructured data? Um, so uh, I might go to, to Kimo first um, and then to uh, Francesca. And then the second question, which we'll wrap up with, um, I'll uh, ask Catherine to respond to if that's okay, uh, which is, how can regulators make sure they recruit the right talent to make the best use of these technology solutions? So, uh, Kimo, why don't you go first on um, how can we best make use of unstructured data? So, um, yeah, I think the un unstructured data is very interesting because there's just so much of it available online or in uh, documents, um, you know, regulatory reports uh, that, um, for example, in uh, in um, uh, the AML uh, um, disclosures and uh, and reporting. Um, I think like our approach mostly is around um, around um, trying to make that unstructured data somehow structured and then combine it with um, other data sources. So, for example, in um, you know looking at um, at the suspicious activity reports to uh, to uh, synthesize what is the uh, text there, um, and then combine it with, for example, uh, with uh, director relationships, uh, co corporate structures to, to try to glue together uh, the reports so that uh, in order to make uh, up um, sort of bigger entities for for investigation so that's one example uh, the other example of course is uh, is for example um, reading online um, um, text uh, from the internet uh, doing sentiment analysis but i think the approach is always around around um, trying to make that unstructured data structured and then uh, to, uh, to operationalize it uh, into, into answering some of the questions you have um, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kimo. Um, so, Francesca, I'll go to you. Um, I have uh, just uh, closed my blinds because uh, I was getting chased around my apartment by the sun, which is a problem I've never had in London before. <laughs> um, so uh, hopefully less uh, sun. Um, uh, Francesca, over to you. Uh, how are it's... you thinking about unstructured data? So, OK, so in in our um, so in console, we have uh, uh... We have the plan to have a data lake, so in that case, we will have all the unstructured data there, and then um, a data warehouse, which we will have the structured data. I think uh, um, I will make it just a, a, an observation that sometimes uh, when we talk about data, in particular granular data, we confuse, or at least sometimes we confuse uh, between uh, um, the correlation that we have between the, uh, across data and casualty. And so we think that uh, by having a lot of data, we will uh, create a very easy casual, uh, so the casualty 
from one element to another. And this is not so easy. So how we analyze the data and what are the models that we use are the fundamental parts. The data are sometimes already quite a lot and we can reach quite a lot of conclusion. Uh, but the first step is sometimes how you address uh, how to analyze this data, because not having a lot of data solves all the time the problem. So granular data, granularity of the data uh, has quite interesting, uh, interesting aspect to, to solve, but uh, I will leave it here. And uh, can I mention, uh, Tom, just one thing, so very brief, I will be very brief. On the next step, uh, because I, as Tom has said, I just arrived in council few months ago, and I expected to find a million of people as per in digital. On the other hand, as everyone uh, will know, uh, regulators are full of people that have used to work on manual level. So these two groups of people have to mix, have to get together. There is no one, there is no way that we can solve the, the problem. And per perhaps a subtech, starting from the uh, bottom up approach. So solve, solve most pro small problems can create a cooperation between these two groups, the manual people that work and embed their te technique operation for a long time in the regulatory system. And uh, some of us that are more digital, more analytical and so on. We cannot have a fight inside uh, our agency. We have to find a way to collaborate together. <laughs> okay, sorry if I took uh, more time. <laughs> Thank you, Francesca. Well, I think actually that last remark transition uh, to, to Catherine in Hong Kong. Um, Catherine, could you just um, explain how you're thinking about uh, talent and resourcing? Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to put you under a little bit of pressure. Could you do it in uh, about a minute, if possible? Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Tom. Um, so I think um, the question um, doesn't really restrict to the pop-up. Uh, public sector alone. I think the problem that we face in terms of talent recruitment is pretty much um, alike within both the private and the public sector. In fact, um, when Chilip mentioned our white paper earlier, the Red white paper that we published just um, a few days ago, um, it highlighted also the lack of talent as a very um, high, high pain point within the industry in enabling the adoption of technology. So um, likewise, for supervisors like us, um, we face the same pretty much sort of challenge. And during the process of um, it, uh, sketching out the lands, red tech landscape within Hong Kong um, as part of the white paper, and also as part of our supervisory exchanges between regulators, we've heard that in, there's no um, quick fix to that. And it's pretty much um, a collaborative um, journey between um, people who do have a technology background, um, so namely data scientists, data analytics um, experts, and people who have actually had the business acumen in actually performing the supervisory role, so the, namely our banking supervisors. And also, most important of all, um, it's pretty much a transformation journey that requires um, people of all sorts of background in order to enable a, an effective and a successful tech implementation adoption. So I think um, the, to us, um, it, it, in, our, in our experience, it's pretty much um, getting um, people of different backgrounds and how to encourage them to work towards the SIPTEC vision that we have actually identified and in reaching that goal. So um, I think it's fair to say, to wrap it up, that the beauty of any of the SIPTEC adoption journey that um, each one of us is looking at is, enables a very collaborative environment within um, our institutions um, to explore and actually to experiment the new area that, you know, where we, we find ourselves diving to. So I think um, that's a thought from my, my side. Thank you, Catherine. And a uh, huge thanks to all of our, our panelists, um, very rich insights, and, and you've been extremely generous with your time. Uh, so to, to close, uh, we'll give the floor to, uh, to Mashari from the uh, Saudi Arabian uh, G20, who uh, is just going to give us a word or two uh, on the work that the Saudi G20 has done this year. Um, and uh, I, speaking personally, they've been hugely supportive uh, of uh, the work that the uh, Financial Stability Board's uh, uh, Financial Innovation Network have done. Uh, I'm personally hugely grateful to Mashari and his colleagues. Uh, so, Mashari, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you so much, Tom. And let me take this as an opportunity to thank you all for a most informative session that really does complement the work of, that the FSB has been doing throughout the specifically on the report on the use of supervisory and regulatory technology by authorities and regulated institutions. So among today's set of speakers and uh, participating uh, uh, attendees, uh, I've seen some f uh, familiar virtual faces and some uh, virtual names. So I want to say that it's good to see you all again. It's great to meet the rest of you. Uh, and these concluding remarks, I have the pr privilege of sharing with you all the motivation to include the subject matter of RecTech and SoupTech among the financial sector issues to be discussed by the G20. We began developing our policy objectives across multiple G20 work streams in early 2019. And when it came to the work on financial sector issues, we were fortunate enough to find ourselves at a turning point in the financial system against the backdrop of a world that was moving forward and past the period of post-crisis reforms. Looking to the future, we realized there remains many open-ended questions on the nature of the financial system as it stands today and how it may look like tomorrow. This allowed us to package our policy objectives under our financial sector G20 theme for the year, framing supervisory and regulatory, uh, which would allow us to set the stage for future work in that area. And indeed, we found ourselves uh, in 2020 in a world that has gone digital amidst the pandemic. The theme was underpinned by four uh, policy areas. The first was putting forward a, a, a roadmap to enhance cross-border payments. The aim of this policy objective is to bring forward a comprehensive plan to uplift our cross-border payment arrangements to be in line with the needs of the 21st century, with the goal of making international payments cheaper, quicker, and safer. The second, exploring the growing entry of large technology firms or big techs into the financial system with a particular focus on emerging markets. This really is an interesting dynamic that we're witnessing and may have unique policy implications for emerging markets, both in terms of benefits and possible risks. Third, it was communicating the transition to the end of a global financial market legacy, the LIBOR, and to ensure the stability and safety of our global financial system it was prudent to communicate through the G20, the end of LIBOR so firms and relevant entities can continue to take the necessary steps to facilitate a smooth transition towards more robust and transparent financial benchmarks. And finally, and the subject of interest for today is the use of RecTech and SoupTech. The report with many thanks to the FSB and RCG members and the co-chairs, both Tom and Colin of the FIN, contains a host of case studies across jurisdictions that add to the rigorous analysis included in the report. These case studies serve to draw on member experiences so we can learn from one another and more importantly, contribute to international discussions on the use of RecTech and SoupTech. These discussions in international forums may help facilitate more cooperation and harmonization data flows and regulation across borders ends of the same book bound by standards and data. It allows us as authorities to grow more comfortable with these discussions resources required. And just one final note to complement these efforts in RecTech and SoupTech, we also jointly hosted with the BIS Innovation Hub, the first uh, ever G20 tech sprint, where Kimo of FNA and Leo of Regnosis were two of the three winners of the tech sprint. The motivation for this initiative was similar to the commissioning of the report. It's really to encourage collaboration amongst a diverse set of stakeholders that are working towards a common aim, which is an innovative global financial system that is efficient and sound and safe. I'd like to conclude by thanking you all again uh, for participating in today's discussion and for taking the time out of your busy schedules. Most notably for the FSB and RCG members, along with the Secretariat, both Patrick and Joe, for their support throughout the year. Uh, thank you and back to you, Tom. Thank you, Mishari. Um, great way to finish the meeting. Um, so on behalf of, of Colin and I and Patrick and Joe and the Secretariat, just like to extend our thanks to all of the panelists. So uh, to Joanne, Chilip, Leo, Pascal, Kimo, uh, to Changcheng, Francesca, Kenneth, Catherine, Alejandro, and of course, Claire and Damien, who led the FSB's report. Um, thank you so much for your time. I hope it's been helpful. Um, and uh, if you want to know more about what the Financial Stability Board uh, is doing on uh, on uh, FinTech, um, then uh, you have the opportunity uh, tomorrow uh, to listen to uh, a very similar session uh, with public and private sector on our work on big technology in emerging market and developing economies uh, that Mashari mentioned. Uh, so that's open to the public as well. So um, uh, you're all very welcome to listen in if you are. Uh, if you can uh, bear to hear more from us again. Um, thank you very much to everyone um, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, everybody.